know me. I'm Don McQuillan, uh, past president of the Institution of Structural Engineers and currently a member of council. Um, I'm a director of RPS Ireland, and I'm also a visiting professor at Queen's University, Belfast. Delighted to welcome and introduce our presenter this evening, Kelly Harrison, um, who's going to speak for about 45 minutes, following which there will be a question and answer session, which will end just after seven o'clock. Kelly is a, a director with Whitley Wood Kelly, specializing in sustainable construction and the repurposing of existing buildings and also specializing very much in the design of timber and hybrid structures. She is a member of the board of uh, the Timber Development UK, formerly known as TRADA. In 2020, Kelly was named in the top 50 women in engineering on the sustainability list. You may be familiar with another of the projects with which she was involved, the Gramophone Works London, which uh, was transformed from a three-story factory to a six-story commercial building using a glue lamb stroke CLT frame. And in fact, that was an iStruct uh, award winner last time round. So we're privileged and delighted to have such a distinguished speaker with us this evening. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, just a few housekeeping matters, if I may, before we kick off. Um, at any time during Kelly's presentation, please feel free to ask a question. There is a box in the bottom right hand of your screen. Um, and so don't wait until the end when everybody's likely to weigh in. Keep the questions coming as the presentation proceeds. Those will be prioritized and directed to Kelly at the end. Um, sometimes there is insufficient time for all the questions, so we'll try to uh, get our, do our best to work through them. You can see um, Kelly's profile, speaker profile at the bottom below the slides. Um, if there are any technical issues during the presentation from your end, hopefully none from our end, but famous last words, if you are experiencing any technical issues, the first thing to do is refresh your browser. Um, and you can also chat live with the technical support via the link if needs be. Um, the email, if you have any questions, is events at istructe.org. And just a reminder that the webinar will be recorded and will be made available on the istructe website in the next few weeks. Next slide, please. Um, I'm obliged to read this. To the institution's best knowledge, copyright permission has been provided for all the materials shown. And this broadcast is therefore presented in all good faith. If the copyright holder believes that permission has not been forthcoming, then the relevant item will be removed or by agreement, an appropriate acknowledgement provided to accompany the e-conference. Um, so I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to Kelly um, and just mute my microphone. Thank you very much, Dom. And um, hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, I will just share my screen. Um, hopefully we can get going. One second. Okay, hopefully that, that's with you. Um, okay, so Anthony Timberlands, this is um, this is a project I've been working on now for the last two and a half years. Um, it, I'll show you a couple of images here. So the, the, these are images from the very beginning, which are, were the competition winning images by Grafton Architects. Um, we would um, joined up with Grafton um, at the very start to enter a design competition set by the university. Um, and this is what um, they entered, and, and one of four, I think, finalists, um, and then was taken through to design. Um, it's very ambitious in terms of geometry, cantilevers, um, sort of all the different timber members, um, but it was, it, I'm sure you can agree, it's a very, very, very attractive building. Um, but really, I think it kind of 
when when <laughs> when the competition was won, all of a sudden the kind of dread of actually trying to get this to work came upon us and we got started to have try and um, work out how that might work. Um, and so today I'm just going to really talk through what steps we took, how the process worked with the university, with the architects, um, and how we progressed throughout the design stages um, and, and focused in on the areas that really needed the attention. Um, so here I've just got a few sketches. These are sketches done um, by Grafton Architects and Mark Whitby together at the beginning for the competition. And, and so some of the key, real key principles here, which are still in the building uh, now, um, were, were sort of sketched out at that stage. And, and a big one was as to really wanting to express sort of traditional timber construction, but in a new sort of en modern engineered timber way. And so these sort of queen post truss structure, barn structures and um, support roofs of barns were really um, sort of visually appealing and, and wanted to think about how we could use that to support a large proportion of the building. But then how do all the members layer up and the, and, and the connections work for that? Um, we also had these big kind of gutters which resemble canoes really um, and and they completely uh, set the geom geometry of the roof which was as you saw on the previous images sort of changes on every grid line um, and then also the, a big consideration was at ground floor um, the building is it, well it's meant to be an architectural school and so the ground floor is a huge workshop full of um, equipment and um, uh, machinery for the students to play and uh, make their own structures and pieces of um, uh, timber and, and architecture and, and understand how it's all manufactured. Um, and so there were crane rails, there's robots and making sure that the space is fit for that. How, how would that crane sort of work on our big timber columns? Um, they're all really these details were thought of right at the beginning before we even won the project and so and they've continued to be a running theme throughout the whole design process so then once we started working on the project the university had a really really lovely way of, of um, uh, approaching the whole thing um, they wanted to use uh, the project as a learning tool for the students at the same time as um, in using some of the students work to input into our design and so we started off the whole project with weekly charrettes they were kind of three hour charrettes on a Friday afternoon which or Friday morning in, in Arkansas which is where the university is uh, but Friday late afternoon for, for us in the UK and Ireland um, and um, we each each consultant um, chaired a charrette and the first, uh, but the first one was actually by the students to show some of the, the research they had done about timber in Arkansas. What what were the forests in Arkansas? And what were the timber products available? And so we were very really inspired by that charrette. Um, and we when when it came to the structural charrette, we really wanted to, um, you know, we, along with Grafton, and um, we really wanted to just show off all of the species that are available in Arkansas. And so we created this 3D model where we sort of looked at um, the likely, like how highly stressed everything, and this is very early, so it's not, it wasn't completely um, analyzed model, but it was, well, what are the floor plates doing? What are the individual members doing? The roof beams doing, uh, the core walls doing? What's working the hardest and therefore what type of timber do we recommend for that? What what fire rating is required here? What um, embodied carbon? Um, taking everything into account. So we created this model which sort of labelled everything, and we really wanted to sort of show, you know, um, the sort of where um, perhaps a, an LVL might be needed because it's very highly stressed, or a, a CLT floor would be the most suitable, or perhaps a white cedar. Um, sort of roof joist or a Douglas fir um, uh, post or, or small beam. And so 
um, this is really where we started and this was our concept that we wanted to keep going throughout the whole um, project. So it was one of the things we, we presented at the charrette. And um, some other sort of, well, some wild and wacky, some fairly obvious um, things we sort of thought about in those charrettes was perhaps even using sort of whole trees as columns. There's a, there's a great um, company over in the US who scan a whole forest. Um, you give them the design you need for your, your column and they, and they find the tree that's most suited to it. And so we thought that might be quite interesting to explore over the workshop. Um, and we we thinking about transport options. Some of the long gutter beams um, were absolutely massive, and <laughs> we didn't really know how we were going to transport them. Could we avoid splicing them, um, or were we going to have to design in those joints from the start? And so we looked at how we might transport um, large members. We thought about using not only engineered timber, but also perhaps further optimizing that by um, um, for, um, using different species within an engineered timber piece. So for example, if the connections were driving the design, perhaps using a hard a hardwood um, sort of hardwood lamellas at that in the connection location to increase the strength and the bearing against the bolts and, and the dowels, um, but then using a softwood where um, it, it was more appropriate on the rest of the length of the beam. Um, and then also perhaps just taking a tree as it is, a tree's in perfect stress equilibrium. Um, it's a perfect structure in my mind, but maybe I'm, I'm a little bit uh, biased. <laughs> um, but really what, looking at how a beam is working and actually perhaps using the material as efficiently as we can to replicate that. Um, and, and so we started thinking about that. Um, these were all suggestions we were just throwing out there at the very early stages. Um, not, not, not all of them, or we, we looked into a few of them, but not many of them carried through, but it was nice to sort of throw out all the big ideas at the beginning and then really hone in on what we could do where and, and, and your mind was open to possibilities going forwards. Um, so really then we have, we have sort of two parts to the building. We have, if you think back to the, the CGI's that showed at the beginning. Um, we've got at the front, which is the main building, and the main building um, houses an auditorium at first floor level, the workshops at ground floor. Um, there's classroom and library levels above that. Um, two uh, circulation cores either side of the building, um, and, and quite a large cantilever out, out the front as well. Um, so really we started just like making sure we knew where all of our vertical and, and lateral loads were going to go and the, this nice symmetrical core arrangement here um, and um, the, it was quite obvious that we could get our cores to work um, for that stability um, in terms of the vertical loads, our floors transfer um, the loads into the queen post truss which was one each side. Um, and then at the sides of the building, we have these kind of CLT walls, which are tied back to the cores um, that support um, parts of the, the parts of the cantilever on the side. Um, and then at the back of the building, there's um, a single story, but, uh, single story, but very tall story um, workshop. And that is supported by a series of, um, of these sort of um, knee braced portal frames with, with the gutter beams that I talked about, or the canoes that I talked about earlier on the top. And so we really started to sort of look at this and what, what is the optimum angle for this knee brace? And then how does, um, how does the bending moment start to change? And where, if we do have to splice um, this big canoe, um, where's the optimum position for that splice? And we started looking at that very, very early on. Um, then we're also thinking about stability in the workshop in the other direction, um, not just in the in the portal um, direction. Um, but how the, the geometry at this stage was highly complex. Um, there wasn't really any obvious way to brace down. Um, we sort of threw together all sorts of complicated ways that none of them really felt that nice. Um, this one sort of, sort of 
felt the most structurally simple, but um, not what the architect wanted. They wanted to see out um, outside. So um, you had to really have a bit of a think about that one going forwards. Um, and so then as we dug into it, we could really see that, you know, there's every single grid line is completely different here, um, with a different angle, different forces coming in, um, different resolution of those forces. Um, and, you know, we had some key elements um, that we really needed to think about. And so the way that we approached that with the rest of the design team was to sort of very early on break the building up into studies. So we can see here with study A um, um, was our uh, uh, queen post trusses, which were the biggest sort of taking the most load and, and really were the sort of most worrying part in our minds that we really wanted to get right first. Um, study B was the kind of um, uh, the roof in the workshop with all the different um, angles and, and um, interesting interactions with the gutter beam. Um, you know, for example, we have a large atrium here, which has quite a long spanning structure at the top and figuring out how how we could frame that nicely in, aesthetic, in an aesthetically pleasing way. We had the roof on the top of the building, which again was quite complex geometrically, how we were going to get that load back down to the columns. Um, <clears throat> the crane rail um, along here and how we were going to get the crane forces through the, bra the bays and, and the bracing. Um, and then also um, at this level, we have um, an auditorium, which they really wanted to be, uh, to not minimize it, sort of limit um, its use. And so we really, they really wanted us to look at that um, for sort of people dancing in, un in unison at a, a concert style event, as well as a sort of normal kind of conference space um, and hanging, um, from two queen post trusses, that was a bit of feat of engineering. <laughs> um, so then we looked at the studies one by one. So first of all, we were looking at our queen post truss, um, and the queen post truss is normally, um, you know, we, we have it here. It's basically a big compression arch, um, and then we also hang the auditorium floor below from the truss as well, and everything comes back and sits on these nice large columns either side. Um, and the really the real thing that we were worried about here was that you know queen post trust in a barn supports a roof and and everything on the roof is kind of symmetrical and evenly loaded but in that we've got a, four floors on this on this truss and everyone could be stood on one side quite easily and and we'd have a very uneven load and all of a sudden there's a you know a fa failure in the trust or very complicated um, load pass and so we really wanted to understand how how we could improve that and so we looked at sort of our springs um, um, and how we might achieve sort of balancing that out across the middle of the truss as well so we had two trusses one on the left hand side there and one on the right hand side um, one on the left hand side is a sort of main main um, truss it's a two-story high and, and the way we resolved those in, uneven loadings was to sort of use a bridge um, analogy and, and have a large balancing beam up at the, the roof level. So the balancing beam span between the two cores, so the same span as the truss plus a half again. Um, but all it was doing was taking the uneven loadings um, from the truss. And then we had the kind of um, uh, struck struck ties um, uh, between the truss and the balancing beam to, to deal with that. Um, on the front of the building, the in, we were actually right at the front of the workshop, so we didn't have to create the clear span here anymore. And so we put two um, kind of anchors down to a concrete footing to do the same thing on this side. And really, we were quite worried about this balancing beam and whether actually we were putting something so stiff in that it was <laughs> it was actually just taking all the load and the, the, we'd made the queen post trust kind of redundant. Um, so we started to plot um, you know, the, the depth of the balancing beam versus um, how much how much um, uh, you know the load the trust supported. 
and figured out that actually, you know, the trust still is taking the majority of the load. And so we were a bit more comfortable with that at that point. And then really this trust, these trusses are taking huge amounts of the floor, um, of the floor plates. And so um, we had to think about robustness. Um, so unusual working in, in the US, each state has their own sort of code and really there isn't anyone sort of checking this here it's kind of down, right down to the designers to decide how they want to approach robustness and and we felt that it was a critical part of the design and so we um looked to um make the members into three members um, of which two were working at any one time um, and we also looked at element removal um in in accidental cases um, and and um, how the connections might work. So then we looked go into the workshop um, and and these gutter beams I mentioned earlier. Um, not only the gutter beams, but the roof spanning between them as well. There was a real kind of want for um, a, a barn sort of traditional timber kind of aesthetic, um, and but actually. Um, the IBC 2021 fire codes in, in the US for mass timber um, required the roof um, as well to be fire rated to 60 minutes. Um, and so lots of these small members meant that it was quite difficult to get our fire rating um, without really oversizing and underutilizing a lot of the members. So we tried to come up with some clever strategies on how to do that. Perhaps one of them, in, we had sort of larger trip trusses, um, these are little king post trusses, um, larger ones in between smaller ones which could burn out in the case of a fire and, and then the, the purlins still span in, in the accidental case. Um, we looked into all of these kind of options at that stage. And then the gutter beams themselves I alluded to earlier, where do we want to splice them? Um, we sort of looked at various different um, positions using our script that I showed earlier. We, we, we sort of um, landed on one here. We, we, we were um, sort of limited in the end by the length of the transport. We were told 60 foot is the longest piece of timber that we can transport. And so everything was sort of set out to that. And we tried to get everything within that 60 foot um, length. And so here we have a well, it's 56.6 foot between the columns, so we're, we're easily within that here. But, um, but then also thinking about that splice, it's very visible. Um, how can we do it in a, in a, in a you know, uh, aesthetically pleasing way, but also not a fake way? Um, and, and sort of thinking about what plates are inside, what plugs and dowels, can we fit it all in? How wide do the, the, tim the glue lamp pieces need to be to be able to fit all of that connection and and then how does the sort of filler piece between we actually sorry I didn't explain earlier but we approached this in the end rather than one com compound section um as two singular deep glue lamp beams that take the load from the roof each side but then the filler piece sort of helps to resolve some of the horizontal reactions from, from those um incoming roof planes and then we also have a canopy at the back um, and, and we really wanted to do something a bit special. Anthony Timberlands is actually a, a local timber merchant in, in Arkansas, close to the university. Um, and they, they're putting, sponsoring this building, um, but actually they don't produce any engineered timber. And so we wanted to try and use something that they did produce. They do a lot of nail laminated timber for sort of railway structures and things like that. So we wanted to try and use use their, their structures here. And we sort of looked at how the fire might work, how, what, because as it's one way spanning, what, what implications that has and what, what we might use. Um, atriums, the atrium got a bit crazy. We wanted, a, they, the architects were quite keen for some sort of space frame, but it wasn't really working in that way because the support line was back back here rather than on the center of the of this and so we ended up sort of having a, a truss up truss in the line of the facade and a truss um uh, on the line of the building and um tying the two together for a straight 
um, which kind of give a, a bit of an effect that way, but it was quite an, um, a, a complex structure. Um, stability, we ended up looking at, we have these very large columns, they're 1.2 meters squared, and we realized they have quite a lot of capacity to take a bit of a moment up down to the level of the, the crane rail. Um, and so then we started to explore how we might brace below this level um, in various different ways. And I, I, this looks like a very messy slide, but I just like to include it because it just shows we actually did this whole project um, over Zoom. And we had um, an American architect and engineer on the ground in, in Arkansas. Um, we had a, a Grafton Architects in Dublin and ourselves in um, in London. We had uh, many engineers in New York. Um, and so everything was done over Zoom. So we can see some of our kind of working messy sketches here that <laughs> sort of, um, was, well, as we were trying to work out together how, how it all, what was the best idea, what's the best solution. We ended up um, putting in bracing in this arrangement. And we, because it still looked a bit like the Queen Post Trust, but it wasn't a trust, we decided to give it a name of the Princess Trust um, as a nod to it. Um, but yeah, this is how we ended up resolving the, um, the, the um, stability in, in the lo longitudinal direction in the workshop. And then just thinking about these connections and the fire protection of these connections and how all that might work was quite important. The, the cantilevers, well, the front facade generally is, is cantilevered out from the main building column line. Um, but then also along the length of the buildings, several different scenarios. So we had quite a nice um, uh, situation on the right hand side here where we could have columns that went all the way down to the ground um, on the facade line, which was dreamy. Um, in the middle, we didn't have that luxury. Um, so we were looking to have a kind of deep beam hanging, how we're going to do this. Um, and then on the front here, we had a gutter beam um, up at the top here, that what well, we had a gutter beam here and here. That that that's another word for the canoes I mentioned earlier. Um, and but this was a sort of triple height sp outdoor space, external uh, courtyard behind here. Um, and so some of these members were working very hard, um, um, not restrained. Um, and then we looked at different ways of creating that cantilever. Would it be with beams on every single? Um, grid lines at quite close centres. Um, what type of uh, would we use? Softwood beams? Would we use glue lamp beams? Would we use LVL beams? We tried to give sizes for everything, so we had a full timber palette for everything we did. Um, the connections of this would be very tricky, or they'd need a lot of layering, and then create a very deep structural zone. Um, we then also looked at sort of larger uh, cantilevers. Um, on the main grid lines with sort of intermittent beams between and, and looked at the different sizes for those and the different materials as well. Um, but actually what happened was uh, everything was way too expensive. <laughs> um, it was a really important exercise to go through because we really understood what was important to the university, what was important to the architects and what cost a lot of money. And what cost a lot of money was the different timber species, because Arkansas, well, Arkansas anyway, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure it's, it, it's probably wider than that, and, um, but they didn't actually have the grading equipment um, to grade, structurally grade their timber to the best of the ability. So some of the sort of really good oak we thought we were gonna be using, when you see the, the allowable strengths and, and um, uh, uh, material properties they were they were not they were pretty much the same as softwood you that you would get in the UK which we know uh, an oak here is much better and so um, and that was mainly due to the grading process rather than the actual um, oak that's available um, in the states and so we were oversizing some of the timbers lots of small members were and the fixing of all those small members were very 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 expensive so we were asked to sort of think about that um, and then understanding the sort of length of the maximum transport length as well. Um, so what did we change? The, the V, the value engineering, having looked at every study, we could go back to every study and say, where were the inefficiencies and what can we 
um, what can we improve on? So first of all, we had uh, a Queen Post Trust here and a Queen Post Trust here. We didn't really need a Queen, we were, and this one here, we were tying down to the ground and it was a great aesthetic, but did we really need it? Not, not really structurally. So we got rid of this Queen Post Trust and we replaced it with two simple columns all the way down. Um, to get us into a slightly different category in terms of fire, um, under the new sort of IBC 2021, um, we, which would then reduce um, the required fire design times and, and the um, implications on some of the member sizes, we needed to shrink the building and make it less tall. And so some of the kind of inefficient small mezzanines that we had at the top of the building originally came out and the other floor plates extended across into the atrium. And that whole building then was set out to allow these beams to be transported in one piece. So from this end of this structural line to the front facade at 60 foot. So then we were being as optimal as possible um, in that. And then also the, the just generally the roof in the workshop, the bays were reduced we spanned each bit um, a little further. The geometry was um, uh, less complex. Um, and the sort of crazy atrium truss just went away because it, it wasn't the most sensible thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, we, I, think, I think going through all of those sessions where we talked about a study or well, two studies each week and really understood each other, um, as a team, we were able to come up with some really good um, solutions. Um, and so this is this is the building as as it stands now. This is a, a CGI from Grafton again. Um, so as you can see, we have um, uh, the good the canoes or the gutter beams still um, in the workshop, but we only have two in this two grid lines here now. Um, this is um, uh, the Queen Post Trust is on this line now. Um, these tapered beams are single pieces all the way to the front at 60 foot length. Um, we have the canoe beam again up here. Um, the front facade still cantilevers, but it's, um, I'll come on to how that, how that is quite efficient in the moment. Um, we have, um, and we still have our princess or versions of our princess trusses or bracing down in the workshop as well. So again, we broke it up into studies. Um, just what, where are we now? What's different? And um, this was just a live document that everybody sort of added their comments and things that we have to think about. And every time we had a meeting, we'd add the notes about each part and then um, <clears throat> actions going forwards. Um, we've worked as a really, really useful document. Um, so just back on that, um, on the um, kind of the main. Um, Oh, this was also, sorry, on plan in terms of the cause and stability and what we were going to be using for that. Um, so back on the, the original um, building on the left here is um, uh, where we were at the start. Um, that that um, then increased in size. Um, we were simply supporting some glue like single glue line beams at this point. Um, but what we actually realised with our, our 60 foot cap beams that cantilever on both sides, the moment's not that different. And to but to get those cantilevers to work, we wanted to double up the beams and put them either sides of the columns. And so actually our um, our glue line beams reduced in size because we were doubling them up. Um, so it was, it was actually quite an efficient way to do that. And it, we were able to get the moment connection to work very easily because of the double beam arrangement. I mean, you may have seen double beams quite regularly in, in glue line construction and um, it's, it's a nice way to get your connections to work. Um, so you can see here um, a little 3D from our Revit model of, of how they work. Um, and then on the front here, um, to help with the deflection at the tip, we tied um, and support the roof. Um, the, these um, uh, the posts are supported at both levels and so the, the deflection um, is shared between the two sets of double beams. Um, and yes, you can see some of pretty simple, actually full, full bolted through 
simple beam arrangement. So you can see a lovely CGI from Grafton there of, of the underside of the auditorium um, and the Queen Post Trust um, above. It's all yeah, nice, big, chunky engineering. Um, the workshop changes. We we got rid of all of the very small King Post trusses that were that were very expensive to fix. Um, we replaced them with CLT spanning up between blue line beams. Unfortunately, we had to the only materials that were the timbers that we're using structurally after the bioengineering are engineered timbers and white oak um, for some of the trust members. Um, there are other species in the finishes in the cladding. Um, so there is still a storybook of timber in the building, cedar and ash, etc. But um, for the structure, we were then limited to just engineered timber <clears throat> and the oak pieces. Um, so yes, you can see here, it's a fairly simple grid of blue lamb beams. Um, but you still get the rhythm um, that, that was achieved with the previous truss option. And there's a couple of just... Um, trying to resolve all those forces and, and some of our analysis models here, we use um, the Lubel um, RFM software to design design this. Um, and so also looking at the details of the workshop, we're now in, in a scheme design and, and we really wanted to make sure we were getting this right, thinking about how we get all of this to work together on, on the beam lines. Um, how do we get the connection at the base of the columns to work? We had to put concrete plinths in here because of the machinery that was driving around at the lower levels. Um, so everything's a little bit raised up um, because of that um, as well. Um, and the atrium is much more simple with just vertical members, um, which it, it, at some levels um, um, are also then connected to cantilevering beams that come out. So there's only a um, these beams support the, the above and then the, the post below sits on a transfer beam coming from the workshop. Um, so just the, thinking about the layering of all of that and how to make the connections as simple as possible so that we use as little steel as possible in the design. And here's a couple of CGI's from Grafton of, of how all that fits together. You can see our double cantilever beam, taper beams coming through here and our workshop beams coming here and then the verticals of the atrium. This is the Queen Post Truss and the hanging members for the auditorium. And then of the bracing down here. Um, so really the Queen Post Truss is still a big, big, big design item for us. Um, the way we looked at it actually, the, I said earlier about the oak not having great capacity. It didn't um, in terms of bending, but it did have a much they could, were able to grade it to show that it had a much better compression um, than, than a glue lamp would. And so um, our compression members in the in the truss are all um, oak, white oak members. And um, then for redundancy, we also have steel flitches and double steel flitches as well in, in the tension members, um, just to, um, to create ductility really. Um, and, and because it's such um, an important piece of the puzzle. Um, trying to get this to be these connections to be as absolutely simple as possible was a really big part of it. This particular connection at the top here is the hardest working one. Um, and the day that we figured out we could do it with just this tiny little steel bracket was a very proud moment when we realized we could actually notch everything in and around. Um, we've got some screws here showing that you really need to add in, in uh, notches and breaks to make sure there's no splitting. Um, but then also it's just thinking about how all the members, because there's so many members here coming in at once, how are we going to make sure we can do that in the simplest way? And also listening to the contractor who really like to use um, circular members to thread through if possible. Um, and the main roof at the front um, sits on these kind of tapered columns, which were built up, made up of built up pieces. Um, and then the auditorium was a big, big, Thing where we were trying to ensure that we, you know we were we were out of the dangerous frequency zone with with this, and so we went through several iterations here to try and understand how to make without making the truss absolutely huge. How could we how could we do this? And so we have ribbed slabs. 
we introduced these um, uh, knee braces at the front here because the, the, the hot spot was in the middle of this zone. Um, we still found that the, the trust members, if we wanted to keep this um, over 8.4 hertz, trust members were going to be absolutely massive and, and just not really sensible. And so we looked at um, a sort of um, uh, an alternative way where we increased the live load to um, account for the ULS vibration case. Um, and we ended up designing um, it all for a, this floor for a 16 kilonewton per meter squared um, live load um, to get their optimum member sizes um, versus frequency. Um, and you can see a little bit more. <laughs> our uh, jumping floor there. Um, you can see we, we have rib slabs here and, and, and they're, they're actually not something that you can get in the US at the moment, a standard like you can in Europe. Um, and so um, we um, showed how they could do that with um, some diagonal screws. Um, and then stability, we actually have huge amounts of CLT wall that go all the way down. And so our stability was quite good for this. Um, you think in a hurricane and seismic zone that it would be a big problem and there were high wind loads, but actually we had so much wall that um, it wasn't so much of a problem. And then the facade deflections on the front were also um, a big concern with the cantilever and so we did a lot of analysis on that. Um, and cantilevering frames either side. And then this is where we are now. Um, we're currently, well, we issued construction um, design um, a while ago now. Um, the project just sort of um, has been through a few iterations of understanding who's going to build it. Um, but I hear um, just now that we're ready to go again. So it's very exciting. Um, the timber engineers are sort of looking at our design at the moment. Um, developing their design and then um, we're going to start sort of liaising with them soon hopefully to um yeah watch it get built on site thank you very much thank you very much kelly that was a fascinating presentation um and some incredible attention to detail thrown in so thank you for that um We'll, we'll go straight into the questions. The first one is from Chloe Chandler, and she says, when changing one structural element to three smaller sections for redundancy, is this a balancing act for maintaining a good fire rating? And how is this managed? Yes. <laughs> yes, it absolutely is. Um, and, and, and you well, iterations, figuring out what, what is the optimum really? I think we once we shrunk the building down, um, we were then within a different fire um, sort of uh, bracket in terms of the IBC 2021. And so at that point, we didn't actually, they didn't, they don't actually require you to design um, for a certain number of, uh, amount of charring. Uh, they have minimum member sizes. Um, However, we felt for this for the truss in particular that wasn't really good enough, um, and because it was um, a sort of key element of the whole building, we designed um, the truss for ninety minutes fire in any case, um, including as as the three member piece. Um, but also the three members sort of interlock around the steel flitches as well, and so um, everything's sort of protected by the timber by the char zone for ninety minutes um, within that. That answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. And the next one, I think there's a couple of people who are asking basically the same question, but uh, George Fitzpatrick kicks off with this one. He says, Beautiful building. Did you have to consider the swelling shrinkage of the large splice members? And I think the other question dealing with that is, How did you deal with shrinkage of the glue lamb in particular? Yes, um, there will be shrinkage. I mean, it, it's all calculable. Um, it's not an extremely tall building, um, and we have very, very large members. The columns in particular are um, are made up from several pieces, um, three pieces, in fact, again, because of redundancy, um, but also because you can't actually make a, a glue lamp column that big. Um, and so, yeah, everything 
we had to um, think of shrinkage throughout and make sure that our detailing was didn't create problems from shrinkage. And I think as many sort of layering up of timber elements rather than um, splitting them and putting plates in and where things can um, pull apart um, was really key to all of that. Great. Um, I'm not sure that I understand this question, but it's from Tim Dubell. He says, was all of the crane supporting structure timber? Yes. Well, oh, sorry. Yeah, well, the supporting structure, yes, but the rail, the rail that the the crane goes along, we did actually look at it being glue lamp or steel, and I think it ended up in steel. Now, someone might correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure we we ended up. But it's on a um, the columns actually come down, and then they're on a they widen at the bottom, and then a steel beam runs across um, uh, the ledge of that, and and the crane is sat on the steel beam. Good. The questions are now coming thick and fast. Um, John Jordan asks, how do the um, US code stroke approach differ from the UK approach? Um, is that in terms of fire, sorry, or in terms of... Um... Uh, I'm just reading the question as it has uh, arisen. Okay, well, well, I can answer both, actually. Um, it, it, it actually differs quite a lot in, um, in, in terms from your accounts, just in... in in terms of how you go about the calculation. We did a few at the start just to get our heads around it because it was our first project in the US. We did a few sort of comparative calculations with Eurocode and NDS and um, they ended up at pretty much the same answer, um, but they go around it a whole different way. <laughs> um, so it was an interesting process. Um, we, we, we were, um, in terms of the fire, it's very, very different. Um, they have a very prescriptive code that came in. Well, we were lucky actually because the as this project started, there was a new mass timber fire code that came out in the US that was only adopted by some states, and Arkansas actually wasn't one. But we spoke to the the, the lead um, sort of approver um, in the area, and they said that they would accept the 2021 fire code, and that meant that we could. Um, we could design to that. It's, it's very prescriptive, unlike our building regulations. Um, and you have a building that fits within a certain bracket and you have to design your members in a certain way and your walls and your stability in a certain way, depending on which um, sort of bracket that comes within. Um, and as I mentioned, our, our bracket actually, um, it, it required us to, every external wall um, had to be lined and it fully encapsulated and anything supporting that external wall also had to be um, fully um, encapsulated. So quite a lot of the beams that were restraining the, the side walls um, also had to have the fire protection um, well, in terms of the charring calculations done. But the majority of, of the structure internally just had to be um, have, have minimum sizes, which were quite big, but because we had such big spans, they were not bigger than what we needed in terms of strength anyway. Great. Um, Cameron Fitton uh, has a question. What was the distance between the double blue lamb beams? That, in other words, what, what was the span of the red CLT floor? Ah, yeah. Um, I'm ooh, off the top of my head because I was always trying to change from feet to meters. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was around nine meters. Um, okay. a three and a half meter cantilever each side. Or no, then, no, sorry, nine to start with. It's 12, three and a half meters oh, cantilever. Yeah. <laughs> great, thanks, thank you. Uh, Raphael Wallash says, did you calculate the maximum acceleration of the floor with the truss for human induced vibrations? Uh, we did lots of dynamic analysis, yes. <laughs> um, and I can't remember everything, all the numbers off the top of my head right now. But yeah, we, we had to, um, <clears throat> yeah, we designed everything to, um, okay. we didn't have to, have to um, sorry, we didn't do like an Austrian annex Eurocode style calculation because it wasn't required in, in the NDS, but um, we ensured all the floor plates were um, within acceptable uh, natural frequency limits. Good. A question I was going to ask, uh, Sasha Nathan 
says, what aspects would you change if building this in the UK? Oh, hmm. what would I change? Great question. I think I'd use more different species, definitely. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. Uh, some of, the, I, I think it might, well, it depends. Could I could ex elaborate for some uh, an hour or two on this one? I think <laughs> just with the with the current um, sort of fire uh, nervousness, insurance nervousness, etc. I'm not sure we would absolutely get away with our cause being in CLT in the UK at the moment. Although I personally um, would like them to be, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think to be honest, not much. I think it's it's nice. It, it, we came to a really good point. I don't think we could even get much longer pieces of timber here. I don't think the, the only thing is perhaps we'd use um, you know more um, European products that are off the shelf that aren't available in North America. So perhaps we'd use um, uh, um, like hardwood L LVL for some of the members, or we might use. Uh, for example, where they had to screw together the ribbed panels, maybe we just buy a normal ribbed panel that we can get from Europe um, and, and things like that. But um, in general, I don't, I don't think there'd be too much I'd change in, if we had the same sort of insurance um, Good. environment. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Adam Ellis is asking, how has uh, service in, services integration affected your design? Good question. Yes, great question. Yes, it has. <laughs> um, we're quite lucky with our floor plates, and the floor plates aren't huge, and we have two huge, large cores with risers either side. So the distribution is very easy, it just comes out. Um, and so everything, um, all of the deep members are kind of in the middle of the floor plate, and there's quite a, between the core and the next column grid, there's quite a thin CLT structure. And so a lot of the service, the main services go around in that zone and get to the front. Um, and then there are some small um, holes or not, well, they're notches in the top of the glue lamp beams um, for kind of sprinkler pipes and um, cables, etc. as well. Great. Um, Sasha, Nathan, again, uh, asked the question, how did you keep all the timber dry during construction? We've not actually constructed it yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we're about to embark on that journey. Um, I think, well, having worked on previous previous ones, the timber gets wet during construction if it rains. Like we can't stop that. But what what we do normally do is um, uh, with CLT in particular and glue lamp, you know, it, it, it's actually fine if it gets wet on the on the surface and the the uh, the. Uh, the, down, the danger is when it can get down sort of end grain and into the capillaries of the actual grain of the timber. Um, and so that's normally protected with an end sealant or it will be taped up on top. So the water can't actually get down there during the construction. Um, and that will be good enough for the until um, the building is made watertight. Great. Uh, another question from Adam Ellis. He's saying, were you under pressure at any point in the design process to move to other materials? No. Um, the the um, university, the whole the whole point of the competition was to build a timber building. They've already built two uh, student accommodation buildings out of CLT, and they absolutely love it. And they, I think, there's 1.9 billion trees in Arkansas, and they're currently not used for anything. Um, so to the maximum potential, not not structurally or in large structured buildings at all, and so um, they will really want to change that for sustainability reasons. So they, they want this to be a kind of flagship. This is an architecture school. This is what the architect should be doing. Um, we we were actually told specifically that we weren't allowed to put other materials <laughs> above ground. So. We did look, think about concrete cores and, and things like that, but we were told no way. Great. Um, John Burroughs has a question for you. Did you include additional design factors to account for climate change, 
in regard to temperature and or wind? Um, we didn't, not above what the, the code required us to in the NDS. Um, but I mean, in in our concern is quite, is quite different um, in terms of humidity and um, then, then we are, it is in the UK. And so there was quite a lot of thought that went into um, <clears throat> temperature differentials, um, where the condensation line would be, shrinkage, um, wind loads, um, because obviously it's a hurricane state as well. So. Okay, this, uh, <laughs> this question from Andy Jennings is kind of uh, pointing us towards BIM considerations. He says, you refer to the contractor's model being developed now. Previous recent iStruct lectures have expanded on the benefits of having a single design stroke digital model from start to finish, integrating the whole team from an early point. Was this ever considered as part of the procurement route or were the design stroke build processes always going separate? And I do apologize for a bit of echo somewhere. Oh, no, no, um, I think we, we, we've been collaborating on, on BIM 360 on this project from the very, very start. Um, it had, the architectural model is, is the model um, and they've built in our model and taken our dimensions. And so that, that is the model that the contractor is going to be using. Um, I think they are now just taking ownership of that and making contractually it has to belong to them and so that's what's happening at the moment but then they will also add to that in terms of every single slot and hole for dowels and plugs and screw and all of those things need to be added in still and um, we modeled them sort of in isolation to show how the details should work but but it's now their um, responsibility to do that for the whole building and they normally do that in in slightly different software because it has to be software that speaks to the cnc machine that cuts the timber and so they'll start that in the revit model but then they'll export it to different software build in all of the notches and steel um screw and bolt and dowel connections um, and then that goes off um to be cut in the factory you're getting quite a grilling here aren't you <laughs> there's another another question from tom tong and he says hi kelly what challenges would there be for the design if this was in a high wind and seismic zone yeah i mean we are in a high wind and, and seismic zone here um the seismic wasn't so bad though the wind's actually worse um the i mean i think the geometry generally is a struggle um the working out the forces on all the different planes of those roofs and how they resolve at the joints and how they get back down to the ground was definitely a large exercise um, we were lucky that we had um, a large amount of clt wall that goes all the way down to the ground um, and that really meant that it was much much easier than it could have been. And and we built that in as part of, when we went through the VE process. We sort of built that in when, and started and talked to um, Grafton from the start on um, which walls can just go all the way down. And we sort of plotted those out, and that's where we started from. So um, we sort of made that very obvious that to get get around that we you know we, to make it as simple as possible to start adding complexity in the connections and the structure um, um, at the base. So yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Great, super. Um, and I maybe have just two questions just before we close out, if I may. I know nothing about the climate in Arkansas, but um, did you have to consider the operational carbon of the building? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, Atelier 10 are the sustainability consultants on this one. And then, yeah, they've been doing very in-depth um, analysis on all of that. I um, okay. can't tell you the numbers off the top of my head, but yeah, it's, sorry, been, it's been a big part of it from the start. Yeah, well, I wasn't sure if there was the capability for natural ventilation and lighting and all that sort of thing, yeah. Um, I think there is there is some. Um, it's not a, a possible, ever, especially in the workshop, because there's kind of dust and all sorts of other things going on. Um, but I believe that there's some natural ventilation that comes through the atrium and openings and 
in, in the upper floors. Great. And my, my final question, there is one more appearing, but the final question for me was about the envisaged construction program, because it looks quite a complicated thing to erect. Um, had you any input? I know you say the contractor is not appointed yet, um, but have you had any input into the buildability aspects? Yeah, we, we well, there is actually a contractor appointed. There has been one from the main contractor has been appointed from the start and um, they they um do work a lot with the university and and so we have from the beginning had a lot of input from them on what type of members they want to how would they where would they start and um, how would they put it together um it's the timber subcontractor that's only just come on board so. okay and what what's the typical type of uh, erection program then Oof, program i've not seen it yet since okay. it's been i think they're, they're still talking to the timber subcontractor so we'll have to see <laughs> all right okay there's a few more questions have appeared and i'm going to take these as the final two questions so from um, max wuzu hello kelly how do you consider the sound insulation of the floor in a school building yes um i think well it's a great question um the, it's a big volume down in the atrium so it's definitely been something that could be echoey and, and move up we've had an acoustic consultant on it um the timber is lightweight but it's here it's quite thick it's quite chunky and we have a build-up on top of the floor and um, insulation rubber bearings and all of that sort of thing on top we also have a cement board i believe on top as well to give some solidity Andrew Dion is saying, um, you showed concept images of NLT. I uh, mm. also talked about using CLT. Um, did you end up using the NTL, whatever that is, NLT, I suppose? <laughs> yeah, the nail, that's nail laminated timber. Yeah. No, I wish we had. <laughs> okay. But no, we didn't, we didn't get the opportunity. I think it, it was just procurement wise, um, in terms of getting it within a price that was affordable, um, they wanted everything in the same package and so it all ended up being clt and i will promise this is the last question they keep coming but we'll we'll end with this one from liz thompson you mentioned the fire design of uh, connection considerations can you please elaborate uh, were all connections steel fletched or were there any other innovative connection methods used um the majority was steel fletched um and the way what i mean about the fire protection of those is that the um the steel so to make ensure the steel doesn't heat up too much and and um sort of create um charring inside the members um we have ensured that there's enough timber encapsulation around it and um, even where the bolts go in or dowels go in and then there's the plug on top of that um Innovative connection methods, I mean, the majority of them are steel fletched, um, but the way that we arranged quite a lot of them with the double members means we, we could simply have three timbers bolted together in quite a lot of instances. Um, and um, also um, the main um, cream post truss um, with the large column and, and some of the large column details. Most of the timber is in bearing. We tried we started every single connection thinking how much can we do just in bearing and where do we need a tie force to be resisted and and how if there's an unusual angle of something coming in we have to kind of do that one in steel um but that that's that was the approach from the start was how can we make as much in bearing as possible 